Yes, uh, that's what we are recording this webinar. That's pretty smart, yes. Good, good, good. And I tend to always be deathly afraid that I'm gonna miss some source. I always have like a site of your sources where I have uh, borrowed information from. Uh, of course, you can look into this more on the recording and so on and so forth. Um, but it's pretty much these people. Um, they are all great, every one of them. And uh, who am I? Well, I'm Joel Fellbom. Um, I'm a Swedish native living in the north of Sweden. Um, I have uh, been in the industry for about 10 or so years before becoming a teacher at Future Games. Uh, I started off like a 3D artist that enjoyed environment design and environment art. And somehow, some way along the way, I got uh, a little bit more away, further away from production and more into the actual design of things before other people make it look better than I could, which always is super nice. Um, I also worked on like 200,000 mobile games or something, it feels like, which means the UX part of it came quite naturally because in the mainstream game industry, UX was quite late uh, to be applied on it as a science, while in the mobile industry, it pretty much started as with Apple a long, long time ago. Um, I'm also a wannabe indie developer on the side of my uh, uh, teacher career. Um, I'm working on an undisclosed game that I'm disclosing now. It's called Hammersmith Saga. There's no information about it online at all. It's coming around year 2077, if I keep this uh, speed of <laughs> production up. Um, and I am not the dog in the photo. I am the human. Very important to keep in mind. Anyhow, let's skip ahead. So what will I cover? I will cover pretty much uh, basics of what is UX design, what is level design, and then I'm gonna talk about how these combine with each other in a obvious and not so obvious way and how I think a lot of level designers are knowingly or unknowingly applying UX principles and UX design ideas to their everyday job. Uh, and then I'll run away, or well, I'm going to be here all the time, but uh, I'm going to run away from the screen and let Miles take over and talk about the magic they do on games such as The Witcher and so on and so forth. Um, and that is the agenda. So what is UX design? That is a question I uh, got get asked every single day. Um, a lot of people think it's about making uh, wireframes for mobile phones or UI icons or something like that. Um, and that's partially because of how prevalent UX is in web design or mobile, but it's in fact much broader than that. UX is basically, basically what users experience of interacting with a product or a game in this um, example. Um, this can be the entire game as a whole. It can be part of the game, like the UX of a game controller, how the game controller translates to the action on the screen, if the vibrations of the controllers in the right place to make the player feel um, engaged with the product. It can be the level design, it can be the menu navigation, narrative onboarding, and so on. A whole lot of tutorials is what UX designers tend to do as well. Um, so it's um, one of these quotes I like to use. It says the mix between art and science of anticipating how players will experience your game using a mix between science and best guesses. Because um, UX is a young science. It might have been around for 20 something years by now, but compared to uh, psychology that's been around in hundreds of years, it is still a young thing. So we have, we don't have uh, undisputable uh, science to back on, but we have best guesses. And we have experience from player tests and levels and UI and how people interact with our products. This might become hard science one day, but it isn't yet. And that's worth keeping in mind. It's multidisciplinary and draws from many fields, psychology, cognitive science, social science, 
neuroscience, anthropology. It's pretty much the stu study of human behavior. Um, so a UX designer want to design, a UX game designer rather, want to design games uh, that will uh, avoid the friction that isn't intended. Our role is not to make games super easy. It's about making games smooth and remove the feeling of a game being clumsy or hard to learn or hard to play and so on and so forth. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. So a little bit about the tools of a UX designer. There is as many tools as there are UX designers. Um, if you think about UX designers that are working a lot with AI, uh, UI, we tend to use uh, software such as Figma and Adobe XD to create wireframes, which is pretty much sketches of our interactions between different menus. If we are working with more like UX in the game design field, we tend to work, maybe work directly in game engines such as Unity or Unreal or in-house engines as Miles are using on the Witcher projects, um, uh, where we create things like prototypes, blockouts, run uh, tests to see if this or that is the best way to play a game, so on and so forth. Um, shockingly, something all students seem to be surprised by is, I think the tools we use most is like whiteboards, sometimes digital, usually on paper. Uh, we use personas to understand our target uh, audience. We use user studies to understand them a bit more. And I think the program I have spent most time in in my entire life as a game designer is Microsoft Excel, the pride and joy of all jobs where you put in like um, amazing data, like uh, this level takes two minutes to clear and we want to have this intensity and we want to have this many enemies and so on and so forth. It's a data management job just as much as it's a creative job, but don't let that scare you. It is by far the most fun job I ever had. Um, so, and also a quote, which I will report, uh, re repeat until you become crazy as my students have become, is that without the user, there is no user experience. Everything that we create and do does not matter if we cannot validate that with doing user testing, with having people actually play our games, play our levels, and we take that information and we look over it and we use that data to make the experience of the player better. That is user experience design. Moving on. Um, well, I'm going to talk about what level design is as well. And then I'm going to talk about how to combine these two sciences or fields of practice. Um, a quote I found that I stole is level design is the practice of planning and building spaces for video games. And I guess that's part of it. It's in its core, you create the field which the game takes place in. If it was soccer, you play, you are the one designing the soccer field or football field. If it's Monopoly, you design the playing board, while the game designer might be the one who writing the play rules of the game. Um, they're usually responsible for like blocking out the level and uh, the gameplay where it takes place, where the beats are and so on, well before the art team goes in and make the level look pretty. That's also important. Most level designers in AAA does not go in and place finished artwork and light and make the levels look pretty. They make something kind to what you see on the right from Uncharted 4, which is a advanced blockout that shows how to interact with the level and so on and so forth. That's pretty much where a level designer uh, might leave it and then send it to the art team to make it pretty. There are exceptions to this as all roles are, and they vary. If you're on a super small project, you probably will do both. If you are on a giant AAA project, you, I don't know, you might have someone who is head of stone placement and master of uh, trees or something like that. Uh, Miles, correct me if I'm wrong here. Do you have any stone artist? 
<laughs> no one wants to admit that. I think at, at the scale we're working on, we do have a um, certain level of granularity, but not that fine. There are some people who excel specifically at doing so. We have foliage artists, for example. Yes. Um, but we don't go more granular than that. I know Rockstar used to have like people who exclusively make water effects, for example, and it's uh, all they do. Yes, we actually had uh, a dude worked on uh, Rockstar telling us that they had rock artist, a guy that spent his entire life to reach that milestone. And they, of course, called him a rock star, which is amazing. <laughs> yeah. But it's important to note that that Rockstar is a particularly large studio, right? Whereas we have, you know, like right 750 developers now, which is a lot. Rockstar exceeds that by quite a margin. So, of course, the granularity can be higher. It's very true. And I worked on projects with about 100 people at the biggest, largest, and usually a lot smaller than that. So it's also worth keeping in mind that this is from my experience. That's why it's so nice to have Miles here. So we can talk from two different kinds of experiences. So you as students or people interested, interested in becoming students can get the input from both of us. But yeah, let's skip ahead. Um, so this is pretty much the steps of level design, how I worked. You, you do your um, overhead map. You, uh, I'm not showing the, how you schedule your beats or the pacing of the level, but that uh, imagine that happens somewhere in here. And you do your block out in Unreal in this case, send it to the our team to do a, like a low fidelity uh, environment design, which doesn't have light and so on. It's still easy to change it. Because that's the thing in production, you want you don't want to tie down your result. You don't want it to make it impossible to change before you know the players will enjoy it. That's why you start with a hand drawn sketch usually, because you can change that in seconds. Then you move on to a block out. You can change that in minutes, and then something more advanced like this you can change in a couple of hours. And then if you have a finished level, making changes are really expensive because you have to pay a salary to all the people involved. But it also takes a lot of time. It can take weeks to change a level or months if it's a really large level. So that's why you want to do it as easy to change in the beginning as possible. So you can play the game as an early stage as possible to get the user experience input. And you're going to hear a lot of terminology when you work in games. And it's usually a good idea when you're new to it to write everything down and Google it afterwards. You're going to hear a hundred different names for the same thing. It can be a gray box, white box, block out, uh, this and this and that and that and this. Um, so this slide is from how Naughty Dog in their invisible intuition uh, presentation from David Shaver. Um, and they at Naughty Dog works with something called a block mesh which is like a gray box um, that uses like a single texture with some colors and light uh, to make it something a little bit more like this. So it's easier to, when I say more like this, I mean more like on the right. I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer or not, but a little bit more on the picture on the right where you actually can see where you can interact. Um, it makes it visually easier to read the scene rather than just having the unreal basic look on the left. Um, so also that's, add that yeah. there's no industry standard for the terminology. Like some studios use block mesh. We at CDPR use block out, right? Some people say they block something in. Uh, it's just gray box, all of it. Yes, block and box is the only thing you tend to hear. Yeah. That's uh, super interesting. And it's one of the most frustrating part of switching companies because you have to relearn all the terminology always. So keep that in mind and try to learn as much as you can while you're a student. Um, and uh, worth mentioning once again, the difference between level design and environment part. Level design do lay out, block out. Uh, they might even describe, uh, usually they even describe their level in the words before they even start to design it. They design the pacing and like how you play the level. It's kind of like writing music almost. Um, the intensity of the level, when does the grand 
finale of the level come? Will it be cannons and explosions? Who know? While environmental artists, I know because I used to be one, we just care about making things that the level designers have created. We like to make it look good by modeling, lightning, texturing, and so on. We are very shallow people. So I think level designers are the people with all the um, depth and flair, and we are the shallow people who just want something to look good. And sometimes we will just kill the this block out design because we don't think it looks good. And then we will fight in house and then the level design wins and then we move on. That happens a lot. Um, but yeah, level designers, they focus on shaping players' behaviors. Um, they also write documentation, draft layouts, build blockouts, observe play tests sometimes, balance maps and encounters. Um, um, and while environmental artists do art, pass, models, materials, set dressing, lightning, to refine the level's visual appearance, while it's mostly de decoration, good environment art, support experience design goals and helps player play. So in a perfect world, we play hand in hand. A final level is the combination of level design and environmental art. When they are one unit that flows together, that's when the best levels are created like the sniper level in Call of Duty or something like that. Um, some common tools level designers use. Um, if we took software, a lot of maps are created in Photoshop or something alike. Um, I have used Excel a lot for making um, um, like beat charts and so on and timelines, uh, things like this that like on in, we're trying to like sketch out the pace of a level or a song. Like here you explore, then it increases the pace with a combat scenario. We want the grand finale to be epic and so on and so on. And you can use tools like this. Um, the picture to the right is a very like high scope uh, presented version from uh, Storm the Tower level design document by Elizabeth Wright, who is a great level designer, works on Uncharted and so many more titles. Uh, what tools do you use in your daily life, Mile? Yeah, there's a new button. Um, <laughs> I have a very peculiar way of working, I think. So for me, mostly when we plan stuff, we nowadays we use a lot of Miro. Um, for level flow charts and all that. But for me, I personally prefer using good references, finding them, good communication with your artists very, very early on. And then I uh, jump into, into 3D really, really quickly, directly in the engine to create, you know, so like, like almost like the graphics you have there, but in 3D, like super, super sketchy, super dirty, super messy. And then take a look at the outcome and determine whether it's good enough to progress where the challenges will be and what the size of it all is. And then I might do 2D. Then I'll do something like that, maybe. Cool, cool. It's very different from each person. And I, me as a 3D artist, from the beginning, I tend to just sit in like uh, Maya or something and do the block out there because that's what I'm fastest with. And I can do level design that's a bit more intriguing. I held a lecture doing it in like uh, Pro Builder in Unity or something like that. And it's like the worst 3D program of all time, but it still worked. Could still could like show my ideas after using the tool for an hour or something. So whatever works. Uh, and I think that's really interesting to hear your side of it as well. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's like, you know, it really is, creative work is highly individual in terms of how you get your, you, you know, what is in your head onto the paper basically in front of you uh it's uh, the only sort of consideration i think that needs to be made there is usually whatever works for you but secondly when you work in a triple a studio there might be some sort of uh pipelines created that people ask you to do uh, we tried for a time to go with 2d first so we could better agree what we wanted to do before moving into 3d and you know quickly threw away throw away ideas that we didn't like before we spend any time on it but i'm not the only person who thinks better in 3d i guess uh, so uh, for us we ended up abandoning that cool. cool yeah and also my office printer started in the background uh, i guess miles hacked it or something so if you hear any robot noise it's not me getting killed by terminator it's just the printer 
um, I'm trying to move on and pretend it's not happening because it is a distraction um, anyhow. At Naughty Dog, it might look something like this as well. And um, I think it's um, especially older studios tend to have older workflows, which is something you, some students can be amazingly shocked at when they come to a studio, a studio and open Photoshop 2009 and uh, 3D Max 2011. And that's the software you get to work on because there's so many in house tools and even like analog things like this especially if you're working with um, a UX team that comes from outside of the gaming industry, because they are a lot like analog still using uh, white, manual whiteboards. Um, our education have also moved to Miro pretty much 100%, but it's still know that you might see something like this. This is actually production from The Last of Us, how they did a level like scoping and a level like progress. So if you dig around the internet, you can find relics of uh, gone by areas or current areas maybe should have been gone by areas. It's super interesting. Um, but yeah, how do you start making a level? I tend to start with asking myself some questions. Where does the level take place? When does the level take place? Is it in the 1900s or the 1200 for the 277 it really impact the look and the technology of the game the mechanics will of course do you need uh, to have things you can hide behind because you have a dodge and cover shooting mechanic uh, uh, why will players remember your level what is the rememberable thing of this we all want to create that level um be it like um, the final fight in Witcher 3 or um, the sniper level at uh, Call of Duty or what, whatever. Um, you want to make it memorable. And what is the story of your location? Because if you sit down and write a little story, it especially is if you have a narrative of the story that your narrative gang have created for you. But if you haven't, don't have that, if you're creating like a multiplayer map, if you still start thinking of like, Oh, this is a war between the alien race of Smurberth and the soldiers of Gadabuf. Then they, uh, you start thinking of their technology and, oh, it takes place on this planet and this gravity and they have giant rocks and this gas sky outside. And maybe you, when you jump, you jump this high because it's a different gravity. If you ask yourself these questions, it's a lot easier to make something cool and believable. And after you've done all that and done your super cool level, you go and ask your tech team if is this possible, and they say no, and then you redo it from the beginning. Uh, it depends on a triple A team. It's usually a lot harder to get no's because um, you have more money to spend. While on smaller productions, it's like, do you want anything custom? It's just ah, probably not. But it's worth start big and then down down scope. Um, it's not something I tell my students during projects, but I think I want you now, today, I want you to think big. I don't want you to limit your creativity by by how many tipped over wagons can we have in our war map for a multiplayer shooter. That's not fun, um, but it's an important part of being a professional artist. You have to think of the memory budget and so on and so forth. Um, we also like to think about the player paths. Um, there's usually one desired path, which can be called a lot of other things. Once again, different studios have different names. Um, so we have the main path, that's our design path from A to B without any detours. It's pretty much the shortest way to go to one place. Um, we have secondary paths in many levels. Um, even linear levels tend to have some offshoot to find a collectible or whatnot, while the end goal is still the same. Uh, and then uh, we have perceived paths. It should in most cases be the same as the main path, but it can be something else. Maybe you want the player to like walk into this door and they think they're going to enter the tower, but that's the tower door is blocked. They turn around and there's an encounter. You get jumped by soldiers and then you have to find another way through, I don't know, through this side path. 
things like that you can use also while designing your levels. Um, I saw Miles' talk on GDC that got released yesterday. A lot of talks of how designing different paths for different player styles, which I think is something almost uniquely AAA to have the capability to also design meaningful playing experience for all of these paths, which I think is pretty cool. Um, do you have any like small comments on that, Miles? Or do you want to take it later on? Uh, no, I thank you for the shout out. Like you can watch that thing for free on the on on the GDC Vault. Uh, I worked really hard on it, so uh, <laughs> you you'd be surprised. I uh, probably not. Um, how fucking difficult it is to make a GDC talk. Very stressful. Very stressful environment. <laughs> yeah, you poor thing that had to do a GDC talk. That's must be hard oh, yeah. for you. Yeah, yeah, it was very tragic. Yes. So. <laughs> it's yes, yes. No, I wanted to shout that out because it's uh, it's hard work. Um, also, when we're designing, uh, this is a screenshot from uh, Nova Prospect in Half Life Two by Eric Kirschmer from the art. Uh, it's an art book called Half Life Two: Racing the Bar. Um, I actually scanned this myself from a book I found under my table here at the office. Um, and the, these are like advanced blockouts when you start thinking of, this is almost like um, an architectural map. Um, I'm supposed to be an artist, but I would struggle drawing this, this like, it, it kind of makes sense how this level works, even when being drawn in 2D on top of each other. It should be very cluttered, but it isn't. But something that also helps people to communicate an idea is actually, having nice pointers, like the guard booth has controls to open ground floor gate. It's cool if you can show that in just pictures, but why not just write what the function of that room is? Because it's gonna make it a lot easier to the rest of the team to produce the right assets. But it's a book I highly recommend if you want to see some um, behind the scenes of uh, Half-Life, which I think is a game that do level design quite well, um, because that is pretty much what Half-Life is about. It's about exploring levels. The gun play is not that fun, dare I say, but the exploration combined with it makes it a good game. Uh, that's my uh, hot take. Um, but yeah, that's my level design one-on-one -on -one on some workflows you can uh, use while designing your levels. Of course, there's so much more. I'm just touching the surface. If you study at us, I promise you we get the rest. So I just trying to sell something now, just to please Piotr here. Um, please come study, I promise. We're good. Anyhow, so let's talk a bit about something I think both of UX and level designers use. And um, it's something I talk a lot about, it's affordance. Uh, and that is uh, and a very advanced word for uh, what someone perceives to be possible. So good use of affordance can make your games more initiative and friction free, while weak or false affordance can lead to confusion, confusion and frustration. And once again, this is in-house words that some people use. This is from the Level Design in Pursuit of Better Levels ebook by Alex K. Um, and he uses this way. I know that Naughty Dog uses affordance in their level design. They are very, very keen on that because they have a lot of UX people that came in and used uh, affordance that tend to be in how you design a UI with good affordance. It makes sense. You see the hamburger menu in the top left corner and you know, if you press that, you open the option menu in Instagram. It's kind of the same. It's like if we have a door in a game and it's um, covered with boards or whatnot, you probably cannot open that door. But if there's not, if it is just a clean door, you can probably open it. If there's a stairway with a sofa in it, you can probably not jump over it. But if there's a stairway without a sofa, you can probably walk up that stairway. Um, back in the boomer age, um, we tend to use invincible walls a lot. It's thankfully something we don't use that often anymore. We tend to at least pretend there's a reason why Geralt can't jump over this object that is 10 centimeters high, um, things like that. Um, good affordance is something that is in product design as well. 
if you see a door handle, it's a prompt that you can use it to open the door. You want the door handle to make sense. Um, one of my favorite uh, examples is the door handle on the Ford uh, El Mustang electrical car, which have a round touchscreen button that you press to open the door. And watching car shows and people trying to open this door to get into the car can be a trip in itself because it's not good affordance. People don't understand how to use it. So positive affordance is it looks like it affords to be used and it can be like a door the player can open. Negative affordance looks like it doesn't afford to be used and can't be like a barricaded door. And then there's something we really want to stay away from that's false affordance. It looks like it can be used, but it can't. Um, I'm going to show some examples of this in two seconds. Um, using affordance effectively will reduce the cognitive load of the player, making the player feel more alert. They can play longer sessions and feel that the games flow better, which is why this is important. Um, it is uh, part of a UX principle that we like to show empathy for our players and we would like to lessen the cognitive load of using our product, in this case, which is our game or our level. Um, some more stolen, uh, I mean, borrowed example for educational purposes is this from Uncharted The Lost Legacy. Uh, ladder, you see a ladder, ladder affords climbing. You can climb that ladder. As fast as you, you see the ladder, you know instantly what to do with it. And in this particular level, you are chased by people with guns and they will try to shoot you dead. So it's important that you instantly know how to flee. So you start running and you see a ladder and you know that you can climb it. That comes without you having to actually be onboarded by that, because that is how it works in every single game that you ever played. It's really important to keep up with that pretty much. Um, here's a ramp from Wolfenstein 2 which you know you can smash through ramps if you have the smash through ramp ability. So this makes sense in this game. It doesn't make sense in all kinds of games. So it's a bit important that you actually communicate to the players, if, especially if you have something that's not uh, standard practice in games. Like in Super Mario, you eat a mushroom, you grow big. In other games, you eat a mushroom, you die. So you have to onboard the players on what happens when you eat mushrooms in just in your game. Um, kind of like in reality, I think. Ask your local shaman. And to do. So a way to communicate to player what to play with or where to go, you can do with just good affordance pretty much. And make sure it works consistently game-wide. You don't want 80% of your doors to work or 20% not work while they look exactly the same, because that's just super frustrating. Um, or if you core, if part of your core game idea is to make a frustrating game, like uh, the Souls games, Elden Ring, and so on, where there's actually like walls that look exactly like other walls, but you can for some reason walk through them or break them, and you have to punch every single wall in the entire game to find out which walls have good affordance or negative affordance or even bad affordance. So. Um, you can use that if if you want, but that's a master move. Don't do that in your first levels. Um, but other cases of false affordance is when there's bad communication between the art team and the level design team, maybe. Um, there's a prop that looks like uh, that you cannot use, like this generator up top, that looks almost exactly the same as the generator you can use in your game. So if the player gets uh, trained and taught that they cannot use generators and then there's a critical objective where you use a generator, this might actually create a lot of frustration and, and they will be like, uh -huh, okay, it was the generator this time. And then we start trying to use every generator from that point on and just a lot of mess. So always communicate early with your team that this will be used as a key prop to progress in the level. So let's not use it as a set dressing prop or something like that. 
Uh, um, you can also use affordance to guide the player. Um, in this case, from the very early blockout stages of, uh, I think this is the last of us. It might be uh, uncharted. Um, if you put out these objects that are very clear that you can interact with like this, it makes it super easy if you put it out in the early stages, because you know you're going to have this and your level designer is going to use this for designing the levels and the art team is going to design cliffs you can climb on and so on and so forth. So if you use your affordances consistently with shape and color, follow the game metrics and uh, tell your team to use this, it can even be like prefab objectives inside the engines to take little objects that you can use. Um, so if you use this early, you will save a whole lot of uh, time while designing your levels. Um, there will not be a level designer that comes in year two of your product production cycle and start designing levels with uh, non-interactive uh, elements that doesn't match up with the rest of your production. If you use the same language, same psychology behind it, all of the levels will start to look the same. And that makes for consistent and fancy looking levels, which I like. Um, you can also deny affordance with what we experts in this industry call nope zones. It's the only official name all of studios have. No, but it can be uh, no go zones or whatever. It's pretty much fancy invisible walls. If there's a broken stairway, you can probably not climb it, even if you kind of should be able to. If there's two, two guards blocking a pathway, you cannot dodge and walk through it and so on and so forth. It can be a way to create gates for your levels, with either hard gates that you can progress through or uh, optional gates or like conditional gates where you have to find, uh, I don't know, these guards looks like they like, I don't know, apples. If you find some apples and give to them, then the gate open up. If you use this consistently, it makes sense. You don't want to have uh, broken stairways that you can climb up once, but never again, and so on and so forth. These are all the same examples in different contexts, pretty much. Um, you can also use set a visual language earlier that's a little bit more advanced than just uh, yellow edges that you can climb. Um, a lot of games do this nowadays with how very obvious visual clues where you can climb, like Far Cry 5, um, the Tomb Raider series have like this. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about how you can do this in a more advanced and non-obvious way, which like Uncharted does, for example. Um, you can also guide with UI. Once again, here comes in the UX, traditional UX role a traditional UX role that uses UI as their main working source. Um, they might, a lot of games might use something like this, but worth knowing is that having a lot of UI on the screen breaks the immersion of the player. They will not feel as involved in this world as a world if all these elements were missing from the screen. So you have to use this in a smart way. Uh, you can overload the player's uh, brain capacity with having so much elements where the eye have to move from one side up, down, around, so on and so forth. So use AI responsible with responsibility is what I'm trying to say. Um, it also changes the entire look of a game. And it's bad for the cognitive load of the player if we want to move back to psychology. Um, a game that does it a little bit better, according to me, is uh, the division created in beautiful Malmö, Sweden, uh, where we are just opening a school for those who want to study in Sweden, you say. Um, uh, they use the narrative of the story to guide you. Um, you pick up this AR, um, I guess it's like an AR watch that projects uh, this UI on top of the screen. So it makes sense in the story of the game. It's not as cluttered. And I think it makes a whole lot sense of if you're guiding with UI, don't overfill the screen. Use something like this. It's very popular, like the Witcher have like the Witcher medallion to guide players, which changes the screen a little bit. Um, 
one of the favorite student projects is redesigning the UI of Cyber Project to, uh, Cyberpunk 2077 while using a UI like this instead, uh, like a theatic de UI that takes place in the world instead of having a map that you have to open the UI, so on and so forth. That's not what I'm going to talk about here, so I just want to mention it. Um, someone I think that is great that you should all watch his lectures. And this uh, very common teacher that we have at uh, um, Future Games is Ahmed Salama, that is uh, nowadays like a big shot at Ubisoft, but he worked on Guerrilla Games, he worked at Ubisoft and so on. And he talks about um, presence, which is the psychology of state of subjective perception in which part or all of an individual's current experience is generated by and or filtered through human-made technology. It's pretty much how absorbed you are in a product or in a game. And having to open media maps that cover the screen and take you out of the action uh, breaks the presence of your game. And it's a very interesting talk and it's we have an entire two week course in this, so I cannot go over it in this lecture, but it's, please go and watch his lectures on YouTube if you're interested. Um, also worth knowing is that all the students at Future Games have access to our Microsoft Stream account, which have pretty much all lectures we ever had in the history of Future Games, which is almost 20 year of game dev industry recorded and uploaded. So I think that is, uh, incredible vault that you can use as a student at us. Very underused by our students, by the way. So do better, hint, hint, hint. Um, so what increases affinity? It's things that makes it more realistic. It can be things like RTX, oh, realistic reflections, so RTX mode on, uh, low lag. It can be VR, high resolution, UI that makes sense in narrative, adaptive triggers, force feedback, high frame rate things that makes you be one with the game and things that can break this being contrast with uh, presence is uh, clipping, static viewed, frame drops, lag, screen tearing, uh, abstract UI, things like that. I think one of my favorite example is the amazing game Shadow of the Colossus, which um, wanted the player to have an experience of unease while jumping because all the jumping uh, movement is high risk, high stake. But for some reason, they put the jump button on the triangle button, the top button of the PlayStation controller to make people uneasy while playing this. But actually to look at your controller to find a button to jump that you never used to jump in any other game in the history of time, just breaks your like game flow and your uh, presence of being in the game. So that's bad UX, man. Um, you can guide with world design, something level designs do a lot, using guiding lines, um, thesis, where you're progressing towards, you feel like you have a bigger goal, which motivates players. Um, players tend to think in larger scopes, like this is the goal of where I'm going. They remember the end, they don't remember the journey. Sometimes it should be the other way around in life, but it's something, a tool to use. Um, you can also guide players by using psychology. This is like UX one-on-one. -on -one. Our attention works like a spotlight. If we are looking at something directly, we see it very clearly, but everything outside of that is very blurry. So if you want to use your vantage points like in this, make sure they stand out. You can do that with scale or contrast. And in this case, both you're probably going to the bridge, if I remember this right. And it really stands out in the design. It's the only, um, the shape of it is non-boxy. And you can see the lines. If you follow the cars with your eyes, the eye of the player leads to that. The eye, the movement of the cars lead to that bridge and the direction of the rooftops leads to that bridge. That's a very interesting way to guide players towards a larger target and that uses pretty much our mind as a spotlight. Um, so how do we know where the player are most likely to aim their visual spotlight? And how can we make them pay attention to what we want? Um, by using something called the 
saliency. It's a hard word. Um, something is a saliency, which means pretty much the more salient something is, the more uh, attention grabbing it is. Or rather, the more attention grabbing something is, the more salient it is. So having clear salient objective objects reduce mental fatigue. So if we know where we're going, the players feel a more flow of their movements through a level. Um, this is once more a word that I use because I'm mobile UX. Um, it's probably some other people call it common sense or like big shiny objects go to where thing, things are blinking. I don't know. Um, there's no set guidelines what things are called in studi studios, but this can be a help. Um, so the spotlight of the human attention. And what tend to draw players' attention are moving objects, color changes, signaling colors like red, orange, yellow, think road marks, road signs, road whatever. Um, big objects, looming motion, size changes, and so on and so forth. I'm going to speed up a bit. Um, there's two kinds of uh, saliency, top down and bottom up. Um, top down is pretty much what's meaningful for humans, like human faces, larger goals, like we know in the narrative that we want to go to the bridge in The Last of Us. So that's meaningful for the player, which means it's easier to find. It can be cultural things and so on and so forth. Um, Something we use a little bit more in games that it's a bit easier to use is bottom-up saliency, which is about contrast of color, size, orientation, shape, movement, and texture, which is pretty much what I talked about in The Last of Us thing again. And some games make it super obvious which way you can climb by using like ropes and stuff like that, while games like Uncharted in this example uses just contrast. Every edge that you can climb have a contrast color to the mountain. So just by seeing this, you know, you can climb this. You don't have to have the art team produce super fancy props when they can just change the contrast like this. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, if you're designing with the attention spotlight in mind, try not to piss the player off while spawning players uh, off screen because that's we're gonna make uh, enemies off screen because then it's gonna feel like they are magically appearing and it's gonna be annoying for the player to so just have sympathy for, for the player once again. That's the UX. Um, contrasting paths uh, is something we use a lot and in the most obvious way it can be like one path is larger than the other then that's probably is the most important one. Going back to UX and saliency, it's about size scale. Um, this, I think, watch Miles talk about alternative paths because it's a lot to think about. Um, but this is something I think is a lot more fun. Um, it's designing with shapes. And this is from uh, my favorite uh, UX talk, which is uh, Jim Brown from Epic Games talking about bridging the gap between UX principles and game design, which is pretty much why I stole the title from or creatively borrowed the title from for educational purposes, which is <laughs> a sentence I say way too much in my everyday work. Um, but pretty much blobby soft shapes, don't worry about me. Blocky shapes, I can be useful. Uh, spiky shapes, watch out. They don't mean danger, it means just pay attention to this. And these three shapes are the basics of like um, all of Epic Games games and pretty much all of Naughty Dog's games because they have a lot of crossover in personnel. So um, it can be this as well, stolen from the same presentation pretty much of Naughty Dog. Um, so cat, box, spiky, Mario, toad, turtle thingy. Um, so let's move on to how they use that in examples from uh, uh, Knights of Force or whatever this game is called, I heard it's pretty big. Safe landing zones. They use the blocky shapes that these are interesting. You should probably land here. You get rewarded with uh, guns. Um, trees that are uh, non-spiky are a little bit of coverage. 
if you hide under them, player won't see you. While spiky shapes don't provide any covers and probably a bad place to land. So they're using these three basic shapes, uh, triangles, circles, and squares. The basics of any artist toolbox. Um, Naughty Dog gives spikes. You cannot climb up here because there is this spiky plank. It, my notes just say spiky equals can't climb. So I think that talks for itself. Um, in Gears of War, they use blocky shapes for to tell the player that you can hide behind everything that is blocky. It's a cover. And since you get trained from that, from your first encounter with mini aliens, you know that for the rest of your game, that all of these things you can hide behind. In fact, Epic Games for the first case of Wars took it even further. Um, all covers are the same height in Gears of War, pretty much. Of course, the tractor is, is different, but 99% uh, of everything you can hide behind is as the same height. And this will fully block the player in a firefight. Even if Marcus Phoenix's head sticks out, you cannot headshot him. It's just to teach the player that this is how it works. Um, so I have some final slides here to tie this bag together. Um, and this will make sense, but you have to bear with me. Breadcrumbs is also something we use in uh, level design to guide the player. It can be very obvious, like you're a German folk tale of Hans and Greta trying to trick some kids to your witch shots. You can eat them, um, like leaving candy trails on a road. Um, it can be a little bit less obvious, like in Gears of War, which I love how they use breadcrumbs. Because um, the player first in this example, picture down left, uh, they see a small pickup. They go, go there to pick it up, and then they will notice the larger chest in the background. And when they go pick up the larger chest and turn around 90 degrees, they will see an alternative pathway. So that's one way you can do it. And the reason this works is for our UX principles of um, another German word, while I'm talking about German folktales, Gestalt. Gestalt laws are core of how we see pictures, the information. Um, go and watch a psychology talk of 600 hours if you want to learn more about this. But for the purpose of game design, you can use this because of the law of proximity that objects that are close to each other, we think of them as the same thing, that they are, that they are connected somehow. If you just take a couple of people and put them in a crowd. We think this is a crowd of people that have some kind of similar cultural thought or religion or anything just because they're close to each other while they might be standing in the queue to the new um, to get the new um, CD Project Red TM game from the game store op night opening or something. Um, also, the law of continue, continuity, which is a real word, I promise, <laughs> which is pretty much what breadcrumbing is based upon. Um, if things follow a path like this, we will pretty much see it as a path and we will follow it. Um, and it can just be the same colors or the same shape or so on and so forth. Um, and I also want to make the claim, and this is my claim, and you can ignore it if you want, but I think leading lines are core Gestalt principles. And that is like the basic tool of level design. We use our lines to guide the player. So I think this looks very similar to this. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I think level design is UX design and UX design is level design. Um, in The Last of Us, they use this in their level design to the almost absurdium, because in their, their art team have like lines up every texture to point the way of where you're going. Um, but using hey, things like- to this? Yeah, yeah please go ahead. Um, so personally for me, just from implementing that and coming up with this stuff, that's probably one of my favorite things to do uh, in level design. I want to add a bit of a disclaimer though, yes. that the stuff that Joel is showing here is all true and super smart, but 
as a level designer, realistically, you need to employ all of these tools, right, for them to be properly effective most of the time. Um, sometimes you will not be able to pick all of them, right, because they don't apply. And what you as a level designer and as a designer in general need to do is you're basically building your arsenal, right, your toolbox, and you're learning about all of these things. And depending on the context of your game, the vision of the game as a whole, the beat that you're creating, the part of the game that you're making, right? You need to pick the proper tools to help you. The rule though is more likely than not, in on their own, most of these won't do much, right? It's really a combination of all of these that will, will build proper flow and guidance in your level. And um, it's really, really important to be aware of these things, but it's also important to be aware that for example, guiding lines, as much as I love them, especially in games where people have free control over the camera, it just takes the camera to be rotated a bit, right, for all of that composition to not really work so well anymore. However, if that composition held enough to highlight that door you see at the end there, right, um, and implant that importance in the player's mind, then it will have done its job, right? But also, this is exactly why you'll want to use additional um, methods like even here um, it's showing the leading lines but it's also working with color contrast I can see right with with brightness uh, is the contrast and all of that stuff so keep that in mind when you listen to this stuff it's all really important but context also always sort of matters absolutely and that's super important and so happy that you bring that up uh, and that's something we, when we do UX design for an app if we something is important, we tend to use multiple inputs, like there has to be an icon, but preferably a text and a color, three things to indicate that you can use it. So having one thing stand on its own is usually not enough exactly with level design, as you mentioned. So it's it's fun how all ties together in the end. So it's- Yeah, I'm it, also just like, because this easily, so like there's a lot of people, also level designers out there who kind of dismiss the value of leading lines by saying, yeah, twist the camera, it doesn't matter anymore. But I think it's misguided thinking of how you approach these techniques, right? It's not like, yeah, you add any one of them and then it's done, right? That's not how design works, so. <laughs> exactly, and there's a reason I think leading lines work. It's the same for rule of thirds and so on. It doesn't work if you move the camera, but when you enter a doorway, you usually line up the camera and that's your first, the first, frame you see when you enter a room is the guiding lines and i think somewhere in your brain that lives on maybe that's also one of my original theories that everyone else had but please steal it um and that's like what are guiding lines it's also a gestalt law of common fate things that seems like they are heading the same direction seems to have more purpose than things that are all random I think that also, even if you flip the camera, kind of still all points somewhat. Um, but of course, I think we have to think about it. And this is the final slide before I close in quote. And this is uh, five visual design principles in UX by the Nielsen Norman group. And I think I have in one way or another mentioned all of these. And somehow pointed that these actually make sense in level design and game design as well, because they are visual design. And that is what we are doing when we're creating a visual experience. You probably cannot use this if you're making an audio romance book, audio book. But if you make it something visual, this might help you on your way. They are not the end all say all. They are tools. They're there to help you and guide you. And if using this can give you a higher understanding of human perception. And that's why I like this quote, um, once again, from Jim Brown from Epic Games Studios. If you understand how someone sees, which is UX, you can do a better job at presenting what they see, which is design. And some blah, 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 plan use principles show empathy for players, reduce the cognitive burden, guide them to a better gaming experience. And I think that is my closing line. So that is all from me. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. That was yeah. awesome. So maybe we pass the stage to Marius, and I think everybody is eager to hear 
my uh, it would be so hard to live up to that <laughs> such a great presentation like also i will say that for me it was really cool because it equips me with better vocabulary to talk about the things that i do um so thank you so much for that joel because basically um the the part that you just mentioned last uh it really resonates with me because it's something I talk to a lot about uh, with our artists, right? Our 3D artists who use these guiding lights and composition just to create cool composition, right? Like you look at, you know, an old master's painting and you get like a really cool um, impression of a painting. It just looks great because it uses, you know, golden rule, rule of thirds, whatever, um, um, all of these things. And uh, I always tell them, it's cool that you're able to do this, but once we add intent to it in terms of, okay, but let's, you know, why instead of just guiding the player's eye to the cool looking object or what you want to show, why don't we guide them, the, the player's eye to where it's useful for us, right? And it's sort of this sort of extra step that you just outlined. And I think it's so, so important. Um, and man, <laughs> I'm excited to talk about this stuff so much. Uh, okay, so let's go to the definitely visually less impressive part of this uh, presentation and the more sort of hands-off freestyle one. Um, here is one thing that I will tell you straight away. I'm willing to take questions also in between because this, as I am, imagine we can do this quite organic. However, um, I also have a bit of a, you know, thing on, uh, <laughs> so we need to kind of move through this as well. So, um, thank you so much, Joel, for this awesome presentation. Super cool. And everyone, please, yes, as you've already been doing. Oh, thank you thank so you. much. No thank need. You. I'm blushing. I, I can stamp all of that. Like, really, really cool content, for sure. Um, uh, okay, so let me now figure out once again how to share my screen. <laughs> um, okay, it's this. It's this. Can you see? Yes. <laughs> All right, so the goal of this kind of talk of the webinar is for me to tell you um, a slightly different aspect, uh, tell you about a sub-discipline, if you will, of level design, which is open world level design, right? And as the name kind of implies, it's something that you'll find often in open world games or a way of working for, op uh, for level designers that expands the knowledge base and the way they work uh, uh, by quite a bit, you know, basically the size of the open world. Um, as such, generally speaking, this content is more, probably more interesting for people who are interested in making open world games. But I do think that, you know, under certain circumstances, what I'll talk about today will also apply to, um, you know, any other kind of game you're making. And certainly we will take a look at some of the applications of what uh, Joel has been showing you guys in actual games, right? Um, okay, let's move through this. So um, this is the button I need to press. So what is open world design? As I kind of already hinted at, um, you just learned a lot about level design from Joel. Um, basically, you know, the, the entire repertoire from gray boxing or block outing, whatever you may want to call it, to all the UX uh, elements that you can add and take care of in your design to make sure that not only do you have cool levels that, you know, look good, that, uh, that are interesting, but also that players can find their way around in them in a way that contributes to their enjoyment. Um, now, while I said that open world level design is a sub-discipline of level design, the way I see it in the, on the practical level, the way we work, I actually think about it more as an expansion of, world, uh, of level design. That is, as a level designer on an open world game, certainly the way we make them at CD Projekt Red, um, you will do all of the things that Joel just outlined. Right, you'll you'll work on your locations, build your blockouts, collaborate with team members on very very specific pieces of the game. Think if you've played our games, for example, quests. Right, so um, we you know like we might have a quest in one of our games, and there the level designer would work on the individual location pieces and whatever is happening there. Um, for an open world 
level designer or someone who's also working on an open world, the amount of work that we have to tackle with expands beyond that. Because now we're not only talking about working on small, small, on the individual levels, but also on everything around it. And that is mostly um, related to how all of that stuff, these individual smaller beats connect with each other. So if we think about an open world, right? Something like this, we will have things like the village level, the castle level, the ruins level, the city level, cave level, right? Thinking about this in Witcher 3 terms, I'm currently working on the new Witcher game. So you can see how, you know, like I'm, I'm not thinking cyberpunk when I <laughs> propose these levels, <laughs> um, but rather Witcher 3 in this case. So, um, you know, you, you may have played our games and seen, okay, there's villages around the map, right? There, there's castles, there's ruins, there's ruins of castles. There's certainly a lot of caves and we have one or two big cities in the game, right? Novigrad and Oxenford to name them. And um, to us, um, relating to what Joel just kind of described, that would be a level, right? Uh, sort of, and on that level, we'd be working with a lot of the tools that you just learned about. Um, and an individual level designer might be tasked with doing, hey, like this village is yours and this is what happens in the quest. And this is, you know, the, your team members, this is the environment artist, that's quest designer, blah, blah, blah. Um, go make this piece of the game work. So by the moment Geralt gets into the village, uh, they have a cool, or they, the Geralt and the player, have a cool adventure together, right? Um, for open world level design, now we're stepping out and we're also interested to see how all these individual beats connect with each other, right? How does the player be move between these different villages, castles, cities, and levels? How does the player find these different pieces of content and uh how do we naturally guide them towards these uh or and the other things are how dense is the world right um because we don't want to over or underwhelm the player with content all of these things are considerations that we make in open world level design and then some i'll talk about more sort of on a granular level about it in a minute but i'm seeing something being posted in the chat <laughs> um it's kind of, why does it? Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> so this, this is of course just very, very simplified example, right? So don't think about it as like individual levels with, um, you know, in other games, these could be levels in the sense that there's actually a loading screen between going from one to the other, right? But in an open world, we're assuming that it's all in one seamless place, at least nowadays. Okay. So what exactly is it then that, if we think about open world, world design, um, that is the extra amount of work that we take care of then, right? I already mentioned, mentioned density, the density of content within the world. This is a process. Um, it's something that you know takes a very, very long time for designers actually to find out the proper density of content in their world. Um, and when we were starting out with Witcher 3, we had no clue. This was our first open world game and we were just sort of eyeballing it, right? And I remember vividly how we started out is literally by, um, <laughs> I'm also seeing some stuff being posted on the Discord. Very good. I can see you guys behave. <laughs> um, so, and there's also, um, we, we were placing, placing on the empty land masses like Skelly, um, these blue cylinders that you could see from everywhere, wherever we wanted to have content. And then we take the basic horse and just run around in between these and literally time that distance. And uh, uh, there was nothing actually happening when you reach any of these cylinders, but you know, like we just wanted, we knew roughly what we wanted to have there. And um, then basically the next step was also to do the same testing in other games to just have a benchmark to compare against, right? So we play Red Dead Redemption or what other game, Skyrim, right? And do the same kind of testing to figure what kind of density and content they had. And then we would compare that to ours and sort of figure, okay, you know, it means probably that at least every 30 seconds on horseback, I should be bumping into one of these blue cylinders to have a good kind of density. That's how we started initially. 
Um, as we grew more experience, and also as we were trying to give you more content in the expansions, because expansions, you know, like the more content, the better, right? Um, we uh, actually went down with the density a bit because again, you know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily because we thought, okay, lower density is the non plus ultra and it's better, but it's also related to um, us trying to stuff as much stuff for you guys into the expansion as possible. So that um, I can report that I think between which three base game, 45 seconds between blue cylinders, essentially, um, on horseback, I think, yeah. And uh, in, in Blood and Wine, I went all the way down to 25 seconds. Um, and why did it take so long to add fast travel point to the crow's perch? <laughs> that is a, actually, I can do this small excursion. It's a super, super complicated um, topic for us. It's something we wanted to do for a long time, but due to the sheer amount of narrative elements that are happening in cross bursts that prevent you from loading into that area, you know, because you would be skipping a shit ton of important triggers, event triggers that basically trigger the next step in the quest, uh, we weren't able to do it. And we didn't have like a system that, you know, properly allowed us to turn on and off fast travel points. So we could kind of, um, anyway, this is now fixed, of course, with the next gen update that we've released in, was it December? So no point in complaining anymore. <laughs> but it was like a very difficult thing for us that we couldn't do for a long time. Anyway, getting back to this. So density, we talked about. I guess that's also the one that's um, probably the most, you know, like straightforward to understand. One that I find particularly interesting is the next one. That's navigation. Navigation in an open world is complicated, right? Because the rule that we try to apply to our open world games is that the player should only ever get lost when we want them to get lost, right? So that means that everything ideally is under our control um, and the player is somewhat moving in a somewhat predicted way through the open world by our design or through our design. Um, and we will look at this particular piece a bit more in depth later because it's kind of hard to abstract in just words. I think I need to show you a bit of that stuff to freely allow you to grasp it. But it's basically all talking about this exact thing what I mentioned earlier, the movement of the player between these different points in the world, right? Um, because so much stuff can happen in between and uh, a lot of things affect how you move in between that, uh, those, those different levels, right? Things like, what are the locomotion mechanics that you have? Um, can the player walk, run? Can they go on horseback? Can they jump? Can they climb? To what extent can they climb, right? How mobile are they when they climb? Um, or, and you can think of games like Breath of the Wild all the way to Witcher 3 and see like very different gradients of mobility that the player has, right? Um, and if you've played these games, you can think, how did you move through the world in those games? Probably very differently. Um, so, that's something that plays into uh, our, uh, that's on our mind constantly when we design the open world, because we need to consider, okay, so we want you to go from, I don't know, Crow's Perch, the Baron's Lair in Valen in Witcher 3 to Novigrad far in the north, but you need to go through a river then, which is really wide. Um, swimming is not the best way. So I guess we need to provide bridges. Right, and uh, um, these bridges need to be placed in a certain way that they're also practical for players coming from one direction to the other. Right, you don't want to walk from one place to the um, to the riverside, right? Thinking you can pass there, and then you see there's no bridge, but the bridge is actually way, way down on the other path uh, on the other side of the map. You need to go all the way there now, right? Unless it's something the developers accounted for. Um, okay. Guidance. Guidance is heavily related to the UX stuff that uh, Joel just talked about. Um, this is basically us trying to figure out how we can get the player to the places that we want them to be, right? How can we make them understand that this is an interesting place versus this place not so interesting? Um, now, in an open world, that is so much more difficult than in a linear game because 
we have this other adage that we hold ourselves to, which is that we want to interfere with the player's movement as little as possible in the interest of maximizing the player's freedom. Um, this is why in Witcher 3, we drop you after the prologue right in the middle of a map and then just tell you to go, right? We give you an objective that you can follow, but in the end, you know, if you want to say, fuck it, <laughs> you can. Um, however, we're also trying to tell a story. So for us, it's this balance of, okay, so how do we keep the pace of the story working while also not meddling with the player's freedom? And that's where all these UX tools that we were just talking about come into place because these allow us, even in an open world, to gently nudge the player into the direction that we would like them to have to continue experiencing the story that we want them to experience. Um, yeah, and we'll talk about these kind of things also in the game in a minute. You just learned about that a lot as well. Um, so yeah. Um, okay, so the next one is flow. Flow is pretty much, I mean, mostly related to sort of, you know, the, the pacing that you implement in the world when the player moves between slots, right? Um, usually when you have village A and the cave, um, you, it's it's easy enough to say, all right, we want the player to go from A to B, right? But in between, so much can happen. Is there, do we want it to be like a very um, um, intense experience, right? Do we have a lot of combat encounters conveniently placed along the way? Do we want to sidetrack the player perhaps with another quest that is, you know, like located directly in the uh, vector from A to B? Um, or do we want to give the player a moment of breather, uh, like a breather? So we intentionally reduce the amount of content what we would put in between these locations. This is something that is also important to consider, especially in the context of quests and missions that you create. Um, and you'll find that often in open world games that you'll have moments where, you know, the, the player character is tasked to go a larger distance between two locations, right? When you enter into a new hub, for example, quest hub. Um, at that point in time, a lot of that stuff can happen. And usually the quests, you know, should also be designed in a way to support this kind of open world exploration. Because there's, you know, you don't want to be caught in a situation where the quest tells you, okay, we need to do everything exactly in this order, in this pace for it to be the quest narrative experience. But the distance the player has to cover on the map is the largest they have ever tracked. So chances are they will get sidetracked a lot, right? Um, okay, flow. Now, moving on. Uh, right. Now, CDPR also applies one last ingredient, probably not last. There's probably some more sort of like smaller increments that, you know, I haven't mentioned that, that don't come to mind now. These are like the big five, but we'll talk about that piece later on. Just make a mental note here that there's one more element that I think is really fun for world designers to tackle that we haven't talked about yet. And you see also in these yellow notes at the bottom, there's a lot of stuff that is connected to these bigger topics, right? Like what kind, like density is connected definitely to what kind of content types you have, right? Because, you know, like having high intensity uh, uh, content encounters, you know, you might wanna have a higher density between those, right? But if they're more relaxed, more Zen, then maybe you want to have a lower density, right? Um, it really, really depends. Uh, same, yeah, pacing, place and flow, player locomotion already mentioned, traversal methods. So, you know, can you go by, you can go by boat, by horse, you can probably, um, I don't know, in Red Dead Redemption, you can jump on people's carts and ride with them, right? Can you drive a car, whatever. Uh, fast travel, if it is a consideration for the game that you're working on, that's why the question mark. Um, then also something that needs to be accounted for, right? Um, if the player is able to skip one part of the map to get to another, then that can change a lot in how they view the world and that needs to be taken into account. And last but not least, at least on this list, content discovery. So how does content in the world alert itself uh, to itself? It could be simply, I don't know, quest NPC that goes, hey, traveler. <laughs> 
<laughs> come over here i have a uh, quest for you right uh, uh, or um maybe the the location is structured in a way that it like subtly reveals itself through carefully placed breadcrumbs um so that ruined castle that's in the middle of a forest which is basically invisible from the outside as soon as you get closer to the forest you find traces of ruins right like maybe just a slight bit of a broken wall that doesn't really quite fit where it was right and it kind of hints at there being more towards the center of this forest okay i think this is the bit where i take a sip of water and we move to some practical examples haha <laughs> And you thought I'd go for Witcher or something, but why not take a look at one game that I didn't work on to show, hopefully, more effectively the um, validity of what Joel told you about, but also what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> so here we have a shot of what game? Dark Souls 3, exactly. Um, no, it's of course everyone's favorite RPG from... Uh, the last year was it was it <laughs> dark souls 4 well you not too wrong in a way <laughs> so tears of the kingdom and i'm fucking hyped for that okay um <laughs> super mario bros 8 bit exactly no it's of course elden ring <laughs> and this is the moment you get out of that first grave which i forgot what it's called and that's the first time the open world literally opens up in front of you and there's so much that goes into the cinematography of this moment and um, that we could talk about right like how you're in the tiniest most like uh, um, 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 tightest uh, uh, um, grave or tomb right and then you open the door very slowly with the animation that we know for three games now, four games. Um, and then you're in this open space, right? And here, contrast, again, creates uh, the effectiveness of this scene, uh, uh, of this sensation of finally being able to breathe, right? But I'm going on a tangent. A couple of important elements in this shot. So first off, you're greeted with your first objective that's over here, right? Like you don't know it yet at this moment in time, but this is where basically for most players, the first major boss fight, right? The legacy dungeon will be um, Storm Vale Castle, if I remember correctly. So you get that, um, looks pretty imposing, very interesting. Um, then another thing, and this is more obvious when you move the camera in this shot, you know, it's a, it's a bit harder because I'm partially covering it. But the other thing is, this thing over here it's an old church ruin right um and another important element is of course this uh with the first grace uh, i wanted to say bonfire but it's it's the grace right and that has the whole light effect particles calling to you right but most players will probably also see that npc down there and since it's literally right in front of you and it's also the closest most of these players will probably pick to go right over there um, with a mental note of kind of saying, yeah, this seems kind of cool. This is cool. Wow, big open world. There's this dude walking around. Ooh, there's loot over there, right? All these things you might see, but chances are that from here, players will move straight forward. Um, okay, I think we can agree with that on that moment. So, wait. Okay, I'm doing a bigger jump than I thought I would. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we talk with the NPC. Fine, the NPC tells us to go God knows where, Stormwell Castle, blah, blah, blah. Um, now there's a cool moment. I thought I had a screenshot of this, but let's talk about it from here then. There's a cool little tiny tweak. And this is what I mean when I say that designers are taking control over the player's movement without interfering with the actual movement of the player. So here we have this knight, right? Uh, who here knows this knight? <laughs> Probably a few of you who've played that game. I certainly know him. Mm. <laughs> I unfortunately do. Yeah, this guy. <laughs> um, so he's way too tough for, let's say, I'm guessing 95% of the first time players here, right? <laughs> like, like he's not a man. He's, he's supposed to show you, you get out in this world, you better respect it, right? Um, so the cool thing to notice here is that he actually patrols roughly around here 
Um, and what that really means for us is as a player, you might run into this guy once, right? You might run into him once, then you die. And chances are, if you've gone here first, which probably most players will do, you'll just respawn here, right with this cathedral in view. And so it seems that then the intent is that what most players will do next is that from here, they'll either try to fight this guy even more, <laughs> shout out to those few of you who've probably killed him at this point in time, um, or they will avoid him. And this entire section here on this side of the level has almost no enemies. I, I'm saying almost because I'm not 100% sure right now, but uh, last time I checked, there's, there's nothing here. It's completely harmless. Um, it might be a bit more dangerous towards the cliffside. So what happened here is that through this, this danger, the designers are gently pushing the, the player to kind of go through the cathedral, maybe from the side to try to avoid that strong enemy that one shots you, right? Simple example of how um, designers can take and manipulate the player's movement in an open world. Um, now that is to say, this only works for these first moments and they probably play test it very often to make sure that, you know, players are kind of keen on doing this. But of course, the player can just kind of literally go here, right? They can just go <laughs> and just say, fuck it all. And that's fine. But then you'll probably get killed even more, right? <laughs> the game kind of has this uh, thing. So next up. Oh, I think the intention was this was also give the player a chance to use the stealth mechanic. Yep, also possible. It is a way to tutorialize it, right? Anyway, so look at this here. So now we are in this cathedral ruin, right? They have successfully baited us to this place um, because we lack a bit of direction. We don't know where else to go. So might as well go to the most interesting spot that is close to us that, you know, where there is no insane knight running around trying to kill us. You see, by me saying all of these things, I hope you can hear out the intention of all these things, right? Like these don't happen by accident in the game. But as soon as we get in there, you know, we have, uh, again, we're covering this guy. We have an NPC, so you can see the fire burning. He will pop out really, really strongly. We have in the same direction, some loot, right? So everything is kind of priming and breadcrumbing and pulling us to look into that direction where nicely carved out, how conveniently nice that the ruin just got ruined in exactly the way to kind of frame that long-term objective of uh, Stormway Castle for us again, right? Um, so this, this carving here is no accident. It serves again to prime that player's, uh, that location, the player's mount as a primary objective, right? Um, even though they don't know it yet at this point, maybe. If we look towards our right, literally, this is me turning to, uh, towards our right, then we have another option as well. Um, and again, look how all of this happens from exactly the point that every player will go to once they get to this church, which is the grace, because they know it's a, it's a checkpoint, right? So it's a good point to know, ah, grace is where players go. So I can set up some views, composition, guiding lines exactly from here in wherever direction I might need. Like, for example, here, where... I'm presented with an alternative. I can go to the castle or I can go this way, right? And again, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm really bad with taking like the screenshot, it was quite quickly, but um, so you have this conveniently carved out here as well, right? Like the ruin didn't need to be open to that direction, but it was designed to be, right? To invite the player to create the affordance that, yeah, you know what, go through here. Um, there's an opening um, and what we see here also is you can see the drawings, right? Like I'm not just drawing in your, it's invisible. <laughs> yes, you can see when I draw. Yes, okay, <laughs> that would have been. <laughs> okay, so also really easily viewable if you move the camera around, it doesn't work so well in the screenshot is this road that they have here, right? And that goes past into the off another element that creates an affordance for the player to run around because we know how roads work, right? Roads, yeah, you walk on roads to go someplace. Roads take you someplace. Uh, and that is a thing, right? And also if you get actually from this point and look into that direction, you can confirm this yourself in the game. You'll see how very conveniently this sort of hollowing out here is. It's almost like this tunnel in the forest, right? Of course, connected to the road. 
Um, and we don't have killer animals here. We have goats, um, which roll, but <laughs> that's a different thing. Um, but, you know, goat, probably not the most dangerous animal, um, we think at least. We might presume as a player, so we might be more inclined to naturally go to that place as well. You see how many different elements come together here to help the player to kind of find this and also compositionally right i was not to ignore like we have this these these this thing going on here right so you have this very strong silhouette you know not just with the opening that i created uh, that i just wrote about but it's very much a gate right um even though the pillars are not part of the gate architecture here right um there was probably not a door here at its prime time uh, effectively it works like this Okay, and of course, last thing, another objective, right? The tower over there, that's right there. Um, so that always feels like a good place to go. All right, the order is wrong. No, no, this is not the case. Okay, so now going back to Stonevale Castle, like presume, let's let's see, let's say we are the kind of player we're like, okay, that looks great. I want to go here, like I did in my first playthrough, because um, like this looks almost like a sort of step or something. I went up there, this ramp leading towards a castle, and you find yourself in at the top of the hill here. Now, it's not visible on the screenshot, except for one pixel over here, but there you encounter your first time one of these statues that point, you know, and then they create this sort of, you interact with it, and there's this trail of particle lights that kind of go in that direction. And it's a very strong tale for the player to go that way. And you're like, yeah, yeah, I'll go that way. Um, cool. Now note from here, we don't see anything <laughs> other than the castle. The statue tells us to go that direction, right? Um, but other than that, is there really anything that would really pull us to go into this direction other than maybe these few animals, enemies here? If I saw these enemies over there on the right and I knew that everything on the right can fucking uh, everything in this game world can potentially one shot me and i have some respect for this game i would kind of try to probably go along these lines right or at least kind of go slightly to the left right to avoid these guys and as um i i sadly can't read your name i'm sorry sorry for my ignorance but as person spoiled there here there is a dungeon hidden away and this, I'm saying, to show you how very carefully, especially this beginning segment, and open world games, the beginning segments are, because they tutorialize a lot, right? They, they have this, the most architected slice of the open world. We can see how all of these pieces come together very intentionally to make the player uh, Bogdan, okay, nice. <laughs> um, to, to, um, to give the player this impression of discovery, right? Just by following the most direct line to the castle, the big ass castle that's looming over everything that is so so temptingly um, um, important looking, we stumble upon a cave and a dungeon. And it makes us feel like we're the kings of the world, right? Look at us, we fucking found the dungeon, right? Well, you got a lot of help with that from your friendly neighborhood level designers, um, but it's I'm happy that you're happy. <laughs> um, also, in this case, by the way, that dungeon is fucking hard. If you're a rogue on, you know, like with no armor, nothing. I I did not know, and I didn't know it was like a side dungeon thing, and it, it destroyed me. But I came out a stronger player after that experience. And the other thing is, if you don't do it, you can always abort and then go back to the church. Oh, good. I took a screenshot of exactly that. So here, imagine what I just talked about, but on this slide with the statue and how it guides. Literally, see, it's even tilting down. <laughs> OK. Also, I guess this architecture really helps because it's like, what the fuck is that even, right? Like, super interesting to just kind of go on. Uh, in the reality, the dungeon found you. Yeah, and isn't it isn't life about about that? The dungeon finding us. I mean, if that isn't philosophical. Then I don't know. So, let's take a look at um, the this from the map. 
right? So we start out here. This is uh, red is better color. We start out here, right? This is the first moment of the vista. You see the church here. This is the statue dude. And this is where the dungeon is. And you see what? Well, it's pretty much almost a straight line. Oops, I can't draw with a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's do it again. It's, it's basically a straight line, right? So here, the designers anticipate it. Okay, big ass castle. So how might the player, like we need to assume that some players will just want to go to the castle. Obviously, we don't want them to go directly to the castle because it's, you know, like you're not ready yet, player, calm down. But exactly at this point where they would hit the wall where otherwise there would be nothing than frustration, right? Because man, I just walked into a dead end. I can't go. Where do I, I need to go all the way around here to get up to the castle? What the fuck? Um, they provided the player with something, right? So anticipation, reward. Um, and this happens in many, many different ways and directions, right? So um, notice how, like when you go through here and this is the camp, this is the road that I just highlighted. So that's the other objective, right? So following to the tower, which is, I think it's actually this tower. It's actually somewhere here. I don't think the tower is actually connected to the ruin. So, or might it even be this? I'm not entirely sure. One of these is that tower that we saw. You'll follow the road and stumble into ooh, a ruin, which is also a small little level that you can conquer. A lot of other places, like in, by the structure and layout of this area here, you can't actually go to many other places. You can, but it's very unlikely that the player will do it because you'll probably be pulled in by the cathedral or the castle since they're so prominent. And most players, most players, not all of them, will probably not do the sharp right turn as you get out, but take the bait of the NPC literally right in front of them and the grace. Um, and then you see how the terrain is also shaped in a way here to kind of, you know, like cliff sides to keep the player at least somewhat in this area, like a very controlled space um, for you to move in. Now, this is essentially the kind of extra work that I'm saying that level designers in open world games also should tackle and be aware of. I'm saying should because I'm not entirely sure if every level designer in other studios operates that way. We at CDPR definitely do. And it's something that we take great care of. Now, this is sort of the lower level of this happening, right? I can tell you that in Blood and Wine and not so much in Witcher because we are still learning it, but in Blood and Wine, we are definitely doing this for all of our quests, the main quest ones. We were basically saying, okay, you know what? Look, um, I'm gonna, take all these drawings out. We were saying, imagine this is the blood and wine map now, right? So, okay, um, this is Beauclair, which is now in the North. Um, it moved, it's a different version of this alternate reality of this game. Uh, and so there's a quest location here uh, and the player starts here and uh, we want the player to go to this place and uh, now we walk there and we would do the same thing. We're like, oh shit, there's a cliff now. What do we do? Players will be confused. Um, well, you know, we need to help them, blah, 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 blah. So either we would add a ramp here exactly on this place. So you could go to your quest place or we would alter the quest and figure out what to do with this. So maybe there's an NPC here and you go there first. And this NPC tells you to go to, I don't know, other guy over here and talk to this guy first. So there's an investigation. Now you need to figure out what the, vampire corpse thing you know like what's going on at that vineyard and now when you go to this oh you're right lined up with the intended main entrance into Beauclair perfect yeah um so this is how we combine the sort of content that we're working with like quest level design and sort of you know piggyback uh and, and forth okay i need to hurry up so the cdpr secret sauce the task that we also do, which I think really, really adds to the quality of our open worlds is actually, I made the term up world coherence. I don't think we have like a, you know, it's like world believability, uh, world planning, <laughs> something like that. So world coherence is really, really important to us. We really focus on creating believable worlds because only if they feel plausible, then I think they can really start 
feel immersive, like a place that exists outside of the player's influence. And so for us, that begins on a really, really high level. And we go really, really, really granular with this. Um, so for this is um, a development map that we created on an early iteration of uh, Velen Novigrad, the hub, right? You can see the mostly it looks the same. Um, we have the Ponta here, right? And, uh, you know, Crow's Perch with the Baron's Lair roughly here. Uh, and, you know, you, you know most of these locations if you've played the game, uh, uh, a classic. <laughs> um, and for us, what we do when we take these pieces, right? We, um, in the level design team, you can actually see this, uh, my colleague, the gentleman map makers, as the gentleman level designers, because we were three guys back then. Um, we were basically taking a look at our world, looking at the geography, and then we were dividing the world into these subregions, depending on the geographic sense, right? You can like like how you would do it with countries in real life, or you know areas and uh, and regions. So you can see that natural borders were usually the ones that were driving us most when possible, right? Rivers, uh, mountains, all that stuff, and then we thought, hey, so what are these about? First off, we we came up with we, we we learned about the overall theme. Okay, what's Novigrad area, right? Farmstead, bridge, trade harbor, blah 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 blah. Okay, in the south, you know, south of the Ponta, it's Valen, it's no man's land, it's war, famine, poverty, right, uh, and and superstition. Um, and Nilfgaard has their camp down south here, and they were raging, uh, waging war war against the northern kingdoms. Um, so. How uh, how does that story that we know that affect this land, right? And we were then going through each of these subregions and trying to define them across the lines, right? So we were literally planning, okay, so in by itself, this was a rich farmland area. However, um, you can only really tell that anymore north of the Ponta where the war isn't taking place. Um, down in the south, the war rages, of course. So we will see a lot of effect of that war on these areas here. We thought of, for example, that this area nested between two valleys, right? You have a hill here and a hill here, would be ideal ground for certain kinds of uh, crop farming and farm work. And you can actually see that in the in the game here. I think it's more in a bit in the south, right? Um, there are farms. Uh, we thought, okay, there's a whole war that played out, right? So Nilfgaard pushed to the north, then got pushed back. Um, so uh, you know they they attacked from the south. This is this is Nilfgaard. They they were coming in from the south all the way, um, and uh, the northern kingdoms retreated, scorched earth. Right, that's why you can't find salt on all these fields. They didn't want to give the Nilf Guardians any anything. Um, and when the, uh, the 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 offensive came to a halt, this is the area that was most affected by it. Right, that is actually the no man's land because the the Nilf Guardians are nested in the south. The Temerians uh, and the Redanians, rather, actually, are holding the north. Um, so this is the area that's most fucked. And you'll see that on the level as well. Um, so this is how we went through the entire game world to think about what is where, what infrastructure is where, right? So um, Grey Rocks has its name because we thought, OK, so this is a very sort of hilly, rocky landscape with lots of stone. Cool thing is that Novigrad is a city, and you know all around a, a lot of cities around it, Oxenford as well. So they might use that rock here to build their buildings. So we will have lots of quarries here, right, to kind of give that, uh, you know, to support this. We were actually thinking of the infrastructure, right? That's why you have also this huge bridge to Oxenford to get over here and one here. Um, we're planning the roads that way to kind of facilitate. Okay, so Novigrad, th there would be some main roads leading through the entire game world to kind of um, facilitate trade through this area, right? There would be ferries that travel that 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 transport some of the. Uh, uh, rock that they would get from this area up north or God knows where in the world. And lastly, um, as a fun little anecdote that I like to tell, um, 
we wouldn't always give this like uh, um, so much attention that we said, okay, we need to have a realistic quantity of this to support the city. Um, but we uh, try to do our best to kind of um, uh, um, at least cover as much ground as possible. So Novigrad, a city made out of bricks, somewhere those bricks must come from. And we thought it out, we looked at our land and went, well, we have swamps at the south there. That's where you would find clay probably to make bricks. And it seemed like a cool way also to give a bit of a shout out to Witcher 1. So we added somewhere, somewhere here, I think, um, a brick maker's village, right? And we thought, okay, that's fucking far away though. So first off, I think it's actually here. Um, first off, it needs a main road connection to plausibly allow for you know trade to happen. So these bricks get transported all the way through here to Novigrad. This road actually exists. But also this brick makers village has a sister location right by the shoreline, which is a ferry place that would plausibly tell the story of the bricks being transported by boat to Novigrad. These are things that we were planning, you know, um, and it was very, very exciting time for us to kind of do this stuff. And that was the little extra that we kind of do when we when we build our worlds. And that's part of world design. Nice. Sorry to interrupt you, but are yes. you OK with some questions from the audience? Because mm -hmm. I see people are eager to know. Yes. So yes. Hit me. Hit you. Exactly. <laughs> Guys, feel free. My is yours. Oh, gee. OK. Um, Uh, I'm, I'm okay. I'm uh, just curious in large scale games like The Witcher, which changes are more preferred? Quest alterations or layout changes? Depends on the state of development. Um, if the like, there's a lot of parts connected to quests like cinematics, characters, scenes, also level design, partially, right? Um, that um, when fully developed, it can be harder to move, but it can also be easier to move depending again on the state of the project or also the location it takes place in. And we usually pick what is uh, less painful uh, or rather what gives us the most quality and then what is the least painful. Um, turns out geographic zones were not so obvious. Go north, meet Vikings, go south, it will be warm. Of course, poverty in the east and the west is... A yeah, I think Robert, that is a byproduct of the scale of worlds that you have because first off that's where you have vikings in real world right they don't live in the south and africa they were in the colder north and scandinavia so you know we try to emulate that uh, of course in in our worlds to kind of keep it believable and because it's a repeated pattern that you'll find in many other games probably that's why you find it predictable having said that there are games that try to create new cultures and think of them within the context of what they have. Think of Horizon, for example, the Horizon series, Horizon the Forbidden West has lots of tribes that work very uniquely with the circumstances that they have and they're placed, you know, in their, their own ways. And I um, think that another sort of issue or why you will find this happening a lot in games is simply because it's hard to really, really do that on a live world scale, right? Um, game worlds are still tiny compared to real life. Um, like you can walk through from here to there in like, what, 15 minutes? I don't know. Um, okay. Can we ask about Witcher 4? No, you can try, but then I won't answer a question. Uh, what was the last point for the world design? That, that was that, the, the world's coherence. Um, in an open world design, do the level designers make individual pieces, dungeon room, or does someone come in and make the bigger world first and LDs fall? No, we do both. We do both. Some like, you know, with a team of our size, we can specialize a bit. Some people will be more doing on the, the individual locations, some will be more involved in planning, but generally speaking, both. Um, geez, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> I have study experience design as my main subject. What will my portfolio need to make you interested in my application as a level designer? 
uh, what is your inspiration when you create levels? And what do you think is important to take into a level from a UX perspective? I'll try to answer the first one because I think that relates to a lot of people. Level design portfolios should showcase your level design skills. That means I don't just want to see ideally that you can make a pretty location, but I would like to see that you think as a designer, right? So all these UX things you just learned about um, and uh, you know uh, the, the, the gameplay elements that you imagine your level to have, they are featured in some form or another on the level. And I think the screenshots that uh, Joel showed earlier of the naughty dot level with like just a little brown dots added to create the affordances for climbing is a really great way to showcase all it really needs to do that, right? If you imagine the first screenshot from earlier where it's just a little hut that you can climb, um, that would be a bad example for something to show in your portfolio. And just adding these affordances, right, for me would make it so much better because now I can look at it and go, ah, this guy wants me to climb there, there and there and reach that point, right? Like suddenly I can read your intentions as a designer much better and I can get into your mind better to understand how you think. And that is really what I'm trying to look for in your portfolio to gauge whether you are a potential candidate for us or not. Um, okay. Could you describe some of the greatest difficulties you've encountered as a level designer at CD Projekt Red? Well, first off, it's trying to tell people that it's CD Projekt Red with a K, not a C. <laughs> Secondly, jokes aside, um, it Who is actually that? <laughs> a project. Um, so, but uh, actually, the uh, is probably working with nonlinearity and and uh, in, in our games, especially in in Sarupang, it was really really difficult to um, make sure that we give the player a lot of options, a lot of things to do, and have the level support that while also working with our quest design team to create like a compelling narrative and sort of finding the right balance when to go more handholdy, right? And let the player not do many things and like other than the exact things we need them to do and when to let go and let them go um, nuts on a level. Uh, that was probably one of the most challenging, but also most uh, creatively uh, rewarding uh, challenges that I think I've faced. Um, oh my God, guys, it's so many. I need to go soon. I also am sorry because I spent a lot of time on this. I, I should have moved faster. I want to show you at least like, let me go like to one, two things which are pretty exclusive. Here you see a screenshot of uh, Novigrad before our streaming system really worked. And you can see part of this, what I meant is this whole world planning. You know, when we planned out um, what a region is about, we also thought based off that, though, this is the farm area, right? Of the major three up to three major POIs that we wanted to have there. And you can see how not only that, but also very early on the main roads were created because this was part of this kind of planning that we were doing, right? So you don't see farmlands yet, but they were on our mind. This is what we were thinking about. And you can already see the main navigational landmarks and activities be placed around that early in the level. Um, basically, shortly after um, our uh, blue cylinders were replaced um, to kind of give you some credence of what we were talking about. Um, what else? Yeah, speaking of major POIs, right? This is a fallen windmill that was created back then. And uh, uh, you can see, like this is in the area I mentioned with the scorched earth, right? The, the uh, salted fields and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, like following this theme and being an interesting landmark, fallen over windmill. Uh, and lastly, this is uh, Beauclair, and I wrote being a guardian angel because this is an older version where we don't have the uh, passage, the ramp that allows you to go from here to here yet. And this is something that we found only later in testing, exactly following what I told you about with saying, okay, there's a quest, I don't know, the quest needs you to go here, but you're coming from this direction. So you hit the city walls at this point, and now you can't go up. The only way to do it is all the way around here and then go through here. So in order to save you guys some frustrations, we 
pick that spot and added a whole ramp up there, which if you've played this and know, you know that it's actually gigantic landscape effort that went into that. And that's how we always look out for you guys. And uh, if you become a level designer, that would be part of your job as well. <laughs> okay. I think I'm, I think that's, that's the end for me. Nice. Yeah. Thank you for this. Uh, I just uh, came up with the idea that I, I ask everybody to put the questions in the comments on our Facebook, and I will kindly ask you at your earliest convenience to ask some of these questions as a follow up of this uh, webinar. So thank you very much. You guys both covered a lot. So I think I will leave my boring marketing job and move to game design after <laughs> that. It's really something. We're always looking. Well, so thank you very much for this. And uh, so Miles, if you have to leave, thank you very much again. And uh, we hope to do it once more again in the future. I'd be, I'd be up for it. This was fun. I hope you guys got some kick out of it and learned something about it. Thank you so much to you for setting this up and inviting me. Um, really, really appreciate it and love what you're doing. Have a good evening with your friends. So thank you. Yeah. Take care. Take care, Miles. This was great. And if you find yourself used in saliency in your next talk with your designers, you have to include me in the credits for yes. the four. Saliency was that one word where I went like, fuck, I know now what I this is. <laughs> Thank you. Take yeah. care. Take care. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, Joel. And uh, I think if you guys have any questions to Joel, we are here still for you. So we, we can have a few more minutes. Basically, what you have witnessed uh, today, there was this webinar is uh, reflecting the model of our education. So there is Joel, a head of education on site as your mentor as, and supporter in your education process. And there are guys like uh, Miles, which we invite to prolections and uh, we, we aim for the rock stars in the game dev. So you can expect uh, learning from the best in the world. We have uh, contracted uh, teachers from uh, Turkey, USA, UK, Sweden, you know, Venezuela, so all over the world, and it's changing. And we are following what's happening. And this is also Joel's role and other heads of education's role to find the best people in um, this particular field, whether it's game design, art, or programming, and bring them on board and uh, bring them with collections. So. Please ask uh, questions, Joel, if, if you may follow the, the mm, comments here. Uh, I yes, hope I have a couple of minutes and I have to run away, but... We still have 95 people here, so wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's nice. It sure is a lot of people and a lot of questions. Um, Joel, how would you describe the student experience when studying at Fuji Games? I think it's very different depending on which site you are on because they all have their own student atmospheres. In uh, left to where I mostly teach, we have like a, we are in a college campus, which means it's very much going to college things as well. And uh, then it's like, we mimic a, kind of like a game studio with like 40 hours in front of your computer creating projects. So it's not that much theory theory. There are lectures, just a lot of projects, 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 and getting to um, be mentored by game industries uh, veterans. And that goes for all of the sites, the last part, but uh, Bowden is this super cool, uh, like a Google-esque uh, new building um, with trees inside, which is very interesting. Stockholm is, of course, the flagship where you're next door to all of these trick play studios in Sweden. Uh, Poland, Piotr can tell me a lot more about, I'm sure it's kind of the same. Yeah. How do, yeah. So that's, uh, I think it's the closest we have gotten to mimic reality. And that is the mission we had. Because um, I was part of creating this uh, school in the north of Sweden. And it's that was the like mission objective. We want to mimic a game studio. Uh, how we teach. And of course, it works a lot of the times, but not all of the times. Um, so yeah, that is my answer. So Mikal, what games do you recommend to play as a UX level designer, someone who are interested in game games, but it's only a player? Uh, to be honest, I think like Portal is the golden example. I am not a Portal enjoyer, 
but I can still very much appreciate the craft, which is uh, mind blowing to create something so complex makes sense. Um, some shout out to game that meet up in Malmö, go there, um, or as we call it, Nord Northern Denmark. Uh, uh, how to play and hide collectibles. Uh, use uh, things like breadcrumbing to lead them there, but you want it to be rewarding to find the path and you want it to be rewarding to find the collectible. It usually is like an interesting path that you can find. Uh, it's only five days a week, just known for the weekends for education. Uh, we tend to well, rest the weekend. Weekend. Um, You actually have to rest as well, otherwise you burn out. So I think it's very important to have an active student life and a rest life. Um, how many students are approximate in, uh, you answer that one. Is there a place for someone in his early 30s? Uh, Robert, we had a lady that was 56 that went to us and two years later joined uh, King as a, a project manager. So real life experience is really valued. I would say that our gen the middle age of our students are around 30. Of course, there's a lot of younger people and there's some older people, but my God, 30 is just a child. And yes, uh, you work a lot in teams and create games together with artists, game designers, and programmers. And some of these games actually lead to real products that are released on Steam as commercial products. Um, so we like let go of all the rights and uh, give the students a chance to publish the games. And uh, it's very fun to see. We have some like games that we created in two weeks that recently got released on Steam called Blockem, which is pretty cool. Um, and for Eric, it's possible to get accepted into a few games with no game dev experience and moderation portfolio for art and design. Absolutely try. Um, the one that goes for the art, especially Priya, is very much a traditional artist that came into 2D. So he came into game art and worked on some games like Assassin's Creed, and he is really easily impressed by traditional 2D. So absolutely worth to try. Um, how many people apply for game design in Boden each year? Around 200, 100 uh, bad year, 200 a good year, somewhere in between there. So top 35 we get accepted. Or we tend to take some extras, say it's top 30, get inv invited. So it's a, it's a pretty decent chance if you are, if you have a portfolio which actually shows game dev stuff. Uh, does it make any sense if I have a concept are created by Midjourney without my own? Uh, no, that doesn't make sense, sadly, Robert. Um, it might be the future, but it isn't yet. I think better to actually sit down and well, the, the, the outcome would be we would accept AI, right? Not Robert, so. Yeah, 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 that's true. We would totally accept the, the AI into our education. And I think that was a speed run of all the questions <laughs> um, for me. And of course, please write question for the Miles on the Facebook. Uh, if I saw there were some professionals in this chat, which is super fun. If you want to maybe work as a guest teacher at Future Games, please email me at youwill at futuregames.nu. Um, and if you have any questions, anyone listening to, about education, I cannot answer anything about the Poland school, but uh, Piotr can, but I can answer general things. And yeah, actually, this Joel, question. this is a common mistake. You can, because we will replicate the model from Sweden. Basically, uh, yeah. this will be 100% the same. You know, we are on a, chasing uh, now the, the best people to become our mentors here, heads of education. Maybe some uh, heads from Sweden will move to Poland for the initial first or second year to bring the culture of future games also here and see it. 
And um, yeah, so please uh, ask me any questions on Recrutatia Alpha Crawl um, Future Games .sa. Again, I'm writing this email in in the chat, so feel free to ask anything that was not answered here. There was one question. Question, however, um, whether our students cooperate. Yes, again, this is the, the clue of our education. We team up uh, students from game art, game design, and game programming, you know, and quality assurance, and let them build their own projects. So this is all uh, what Future Games is about. You create four game projects during two years, and this is what makes you really savvy in in terms of. Agile Scrum methodology and um, 30 weeks of internship is included in this uh, course. So we organize it for you, for our students, uh, and we mentor it. So basically you finish the course having four games created in teams and uh, having 30 weeks of internship. And correct me, Joel, if I'm wrong, but in Sweden it's uh, like you finish your internship and the next day you are on the payroll in the same company. Uh, as a as a employee, right? So basically, ninety five percent of the case, yes. 90, yeah. So this is the whole goal behind Future Games, to get you into the market on the best possible level to the company you really want to work for. So by the HR departments of the companies, we are perceived as you know as their headhunters in a way. We also consult our curriculum, so uh, all the things that we teach that you can find on our website in details uh, are consulted every three months, every four months with the representatives of uh, uh, game dev industry. So we have, uh, in Sweden, we have uh, in our educational board uh, representatives of uh, Epic, DICE, Avalanche, uh, Starbreeze, Hazelight, and these people tell us what we should teach. It's not like we are there and they are on the other side of the river. No, we are basically a part of the industry in Sweden. And this is the position we build up for these 20 years. And right now we are in dialogue in Poland with, uh, with the biggest, with CD Projekt Red. Uh, there will be partnership uh, with, with the biggest game dev companies. I'm in a constant working dialogue with 40 game dev companies already in Poland. And, uh, you know, uh, CD Projekt Red, huge tech land, flying white hawk, people can fly being uh, among them. So we want to bring this culture of education and we are more than welcome by, by the industry. So, yeah. Any more questions here? Yeah, the, the question about sound design is very often asked. Uh, we are thinking about this, but uh, we don't have these courses for now. So sorry about this, guys. Okay, I think we will be wrapping up. Please follow us on uh, on social media on our Facebook website. We will come up with uh, with the next webinars. We already had um, a webinar with our head of education on game art. The other one on uh, game programming. This is uh, the recording you can you can watch if you are into game programming as well. And the next webinars will come. Uh, the, the, in a week, we are meeting with with uh, representative of. Uh, um, uh, of CD Projekt Red again. Uh, she's uh, um, head um, director of inclusion, and we want to encourage girls to get into the game dev because the numbers are in Poland in comparison to Sweden are really low. It's like half of um, uh, of game dev uh, professionals in Poland work in in comparison to Sweden. So we want to increase the numbers of girls working for game dev. So we will have like a panel discussion and sharing uh, experiences by our students and teachers, female students, female teachers from Sweden. And uh, we will be talking about uh, glass ceiling. So feel free to join us. Um, girls and guys, uh, you're both welcome. Uh, we are inclusive. Um, and I think for today, it will be all. Joel, do you have something to add? No, yes, thank you, Piotr, for making this happen. Um, no, I am you. in general quite a busy person, but when I heard you got uh, Miles on board, I was like, heck yeah. So um, super fun to, to do this. I have to bribe even my own colleagues from my company. You know? Yeah, that, <laughs> that is true. Thanks.
Okay, so I had a time of my life. This was so thank fun. And our audience, you. great questions, and thank you again. Um, stay tuned. Bye bye. Have a good evening. Bye bye. Bye bye.